as uh, you probably all know, but this is a uh, meeting to uh, learn a lot more about the Farm Bill, discuss it, and uh, figure out what it is that uh, we need to do and uh, or not do. And uh, so I'd uh, contacted Scott Zimmerman, who's the, uh, uh, the uh, lobbyist for the in here in Wyoming, and uh, he was not able to make it, but uh, uh, he said, I've got someone that's probably even better, he said. And he certainly sings his praises. So tonight we have uh, Leland Swinson. Uh, he is in the Denver office of the Farmers, uh, National Farmers Union. He was the president of the National Organization for 14 years. And uh, when he left there, he uh, spent a small, uh, uh, short time with the uh, California Community Alliance of Family Farmers in uh, California. And uh, then he actually decided he'd come back. So I think in 2006, he returned as a vice president, I believe, uh, in, uh, in, the, in his headquarters in Denver, works out of their Denver office. Please welcome uh, Lee Swinson. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> well, thank you for the opportunity to be with you, and I think we'll try to be more informal tonight than a formal presentation. Um, that way you can address the issues you want. But I think it's really important as we take a look at government and its partnership with agriculture that we kind of reflect back a little bit that it's been around for a long time. I mean, you can go back, I think, probably to the 1800s of when government partnered in putting together some of the agricultural programs that helped advance agriculture. Uh, you can look back at when we passed the first uh, Sherman Antitrust Laws. Uh, we tried to break the monopolies that were having a direct control over much of agriculture's inputs and the direction in which uh, family farmers, ranchers could go. And so government felt they needed that protection. And at the same time, they allowed uh, via the Capra Volstead Act, which was passed in the early 1900s, that farmers could collab, ranchers could collaborate together and form cooperatives of which to look at procuring their input supplies, be it from fence posts and wire to seeds to uh, you name it, fertilizers, and it's moved on up the channel as to what, a, what they can do now uh, through that cooperative movement. So uh, the interesting thing that I think when you look at the politics today and the debate that we're having over farm and food policy versus what happened back in the early, late 1800s and early 1900s. But to uh, give you an example, the Capra Volstead Act, which was the right to form cooperatives, passed the Senate 58 to 1. And it passed the House of Representatives 276 to 8. Could you imagine any kind of vote like that today in the <laughs> politics that we have? Uh, but that shows you that there was strong bipartisan. It wasn't partisan politics that came into play with, much, with many of the issues that faced rural America at that time. And so we can take a look uh, of the farm programs that unfolded originally out of the 30s and the Great Depression uh, were about annual farm programs. They were written about every year. And it wasn't until about the 1960s that they said, uh, we got to probably do a longer term farm program. And that was when they started looking at five year farm programs. Now they still tweaked them about every year, but they were five years in duration. So they looked at budgeting process. They looked at that kind of a cycle for funding. Then if you take a look in the 1970s, it grew more to be a food and farm bill. We started adding other titles within the farm bill. It wasn't until the 70s that we started to add a nutrition title uh, into the farm program, and we added many other uh, programs that were out there but weren't all collectively together. And I think under the farm program have better served not only agriculture but many of the constituencies of agriculture and many of the programs that rely back to the ability to do a good job of farming and ranching. How many of you can just guess the number of titles that were in the last farm bill that was adopted in 2008 that got put into place? 
Probably a hundred. No, not quite a hundred. Uh, there was uh, 15 different titles. A lot of different programs. Probably a hundred and some programs, but all under 15 titles. And within those, you have titles that relate to, of course, the commodity title. You have a credit title. You have a conservation title. You have the forestry title. You have the nutrition title. And you, you know, go on down the line, trade title, and go on down, down the line. So within each of those titles, then, is different programs. And that's where it's really gotten to be more complex as we take and have a discussion of what does the farm program mean? Because now you'll hear a lot of talk within the debate on the farm program is, you know, boy, the cost of that commodity title. If we could just do away with direct payments, if we could cut those subsidies to farmers, it would change the dynamics of our food system. Well, one of the questions I want to ask you is, uh, what percent of the total budget, federal budget, do you think goes in to all the different titles that relate to the farm bill? One percent, one or two percent. 1.9 percent. 1.9% of the total budget. When you take a look at then that 1.9%, what portion do you think lies within the commodities title? Real time. <laughs> Less than that. 13.8%. Do you know what the largest portion of the dollar spent in the farm program is? Well, not just SNAP in itself, but nutrition titles. 80 cents of every dollar that is spent in the farm bill goes to nutrition programs. That's not only the SNAP program, it's school breakfast programs, school lunch programs, the WIC program, many very, very important programs. But when we talk about the farm bill, or the farm and food bill, as I like to refer to it, 80 cents, that's where we start. 80 cents of every dollar. So you get about 13.8 cents that relates to the commodity title. Crop insurance, which is part of the farm bill, is 7.8 cents. And when you look at conservation, which is another aspect of the farm bill, 9.2 cents of every dollar. So it just gives you an idea that, you know, number one, when they talk about the deficit and agriculture, part of that is pretty minuscule. You could eliminate all the farm and food programs and you wouldn't make a dent in balancing the budget. And then when you take a look at where they're going to make dramatic cuts, you know, they got to cut pretty much out of this part. Which is which part? What part? Oh, they're going to have to cut out of commodity programs, crop insurance, conservation, and other. The reason is, is that there's two makeups in the way you fund a farm bill. One is entitlement programs, and the other is discretionary spending, annual appropriations. And the way that most of the nutrition programs are put together, that's called an entitlement program. In other words, if the need is there, the person meets the criteria of the program, the dollars are spent. If a family is below the poverty level, and they submit all the forms necessary, they're going to be eligible for food assistance. Okay? And so those programs are going to be funded. What, what Congress does sometimes to reduce the allocation of those programs is tweak the eligibility. Instead of being five feet, two inches tall, you now have to be five feet, four inches tall to be eligible. They'll tweak the eligibility criteria to sort of eliminate a number of people. Now, I don't know that that best serves those in need because then it drives more demand within the, you know, food banks and church community, or it takes food off their table to meet the expenses of rent or utilities other living needs. And that's one of the things that we see within our school system in low-income areas 
more and more kids are coming to school not having ate breakfast, and that they get a breakfast program, that's their first nutritious meal of the day, and if they get lunch, that may be their last nutritious meal of the day. And that's pretty sad for a country as well, wealthy as we are and the ability to produce as much food as we can produce. Yes? Do we, as just uh, above the poverty line people, benefit from those entitlements also that are in this farm and food bills? Yeah, I don't know what the exact cutoff is, but most of the programs right now, they're a percentage above the poverty level. Um, I'm not sure if it's 120% or 133%, but, but you can check with your local uh, officials and they will tell you that criteria that you meet. But it is on the lower income. Uh, you don't have to be at the poverty level, but you've got to be within a certain percentage of the poverty level. And that depends on how many then are within the family. If it's an individual, if it's a couple, or if it's a family of three or four or however many. So uh, it's important that those people check to find out the eligibility uh, within each of those programs. So uh, that's, that's an important, important part. So now where are we at in the Farm Bill? Uh, first of all, uh, we passed, it was supposed to be passed in 2007, got passed in 2008, and it expired September of last year. Well, Congress couldn't get their act together. The Senate passed a Farm Bill. House Ag Committee passed a Farm Bill, but the House failed to act on the Farm Bill as a whole. So it couldn't go to conference committee and move forward. And so as part of the negotiations of the fiscal cliff, they extended uh, parts of the farm program until September of now 2013. The argument over that was milk prices were gonna go high. And so that was the sort of the focus of why they needed to extend the farm bill. Do you know why they proposed milk prices were going to go that high? Lack of food. Lack of corn. No. The way the farm bill is written, if they fail to renew a farm bill, farm policy reverts back to the law, I believe, of 1949. And in the 1940s, we used what we called supply management programs. And that was when you had support mechanisms in place of which to limit the amount of production, also to try to keep prices relatively good in the market. And for dairy, it would have meant that we would have changed back to the pricing system of the 1940s, which had a higher price support based on then some cost of production, parity prices. So producers would have gotten more, which would have then reflected in consumers paying a little more. And that's why so many say, when they look at farm policy, it's really a policy that tries to keep food prices low. It's a cheap food policy, many refer to it as. And that is that the support prices are so low that it keeps prices in the marketplace low. Yes? So which parts got extended through this deal? Okay. The commodity program got extended, so there will be direct payments going into the spring for producers based on their past payments. Uh, crop insurance will continue. Um, the rural development title is continued with its programs. Uh, conservation programs are continued. The area that really got hurt the worst is in the area of a lot of the local food systems. Right. <laughs> and they did cut uh, the monies in that area. And so what we're trying to urge Congress to do is in both the Senate pass bill and the House committee, they had not really made any changes to those titles of the bill. There was minor disagreements in the area of most of the titles of the Farm Bill. Where there was a disagreement was in the amount of reductions in the nutrition title. And so we're hoping that Congress will begin to move rather quickly in adopting the new Farm Bill and restoring the programs related to organic food production, local food systems, 
in those areas. So when that extension goes until, when did you say? Um, September. Uh, September. Mm -hmm. And so do you expect that anything will happen between? Well, there will be some discretion. Yeah. There will be some discretionary monies that carry over in the current farm bill that will be used to help tide some of these programs over. But you won't see new initiatives being launched with any of the any of those areas. And, and not likely to see really any new bill come to fruition until September. No, they won't. They, its enactment date will be end of September. Or October, October or November. Yeah. And the reason that that will come into play is that with the reductions that Mitch McConnell rolled in in the negotiations on the, on the physical cliff, is they'll start the new fiscal year, October 1st. Congress operates on an October 1st fiscal year. So when they budget all the different farm program titles, they're able to budget on a 10-year basis, even though it's a five-year farm bill, and relate that to what agriculture, what the farm bill's share of the overall deficit reduction will be. When the Senate passed its farm bill, it had calculated that its contribution was going to be about $23 billion. When the House passed theirs, they were at about $35 billion. The difference being in really the only title, and that was in the nutrition title. And there was hope that they could negotiate out a difference. The administration in their budget had called for agriculture to contribute right around $30 billion in the uh, deficit reduction. So we're in, we're in that window where the Senate is and where the House is. From the Farmers Union standpoint, what we think needs to be done is in 2011, Congress restructured the crop insurance uh, program and they cut about $6 billion at that time in the support of the crop insurance program. We want that counted in the calculations. So if you took Let's say between the difference of the House and Senate, they came up with a 25 or $26 billion reduction in farm program and food program costs. Add to that the six, we'd be at $31, $32 billion as agriculture's contribution. For our share of the overall budget, we're stepping up very strongly in trying to meet the deficit goals that are laid out in trying to reduce our nation's deficit. I don't think we should ask that agriculture or the food part portions take any more of that reduction. And some of those reductions are targeted, first of all, uh, you've heard of the direct payments that have been made. It's been pretty hard to defend those direct payments when commodity prices are relatively good. And so they're proposing to eliminate those. We support that, okay? And uh, what we want to make sure we do, that's $5 billion a year. So over 10 years, that's $50 billion in reduction. We want some of that money reallocated over to the crop insurance program so that we can maintain a viable crop insurance program. The other thing we want is a disaster program. And there's two things that come into play. One is, is that we have not had a good crop insurance program for organic production. And the reason is there's not a history. It's not reported via the Farm Service Agency to be able to talk about yields on your farm or ranch. Um, so what we're trying to get is a program that can help bring that about so that we can provide realistic underwriting in relation to what we're doing in organic production. So we can have crop insurance should Mother Nature fail us. The other thing that we and, and the other thing we want is in the disaster program. So we don't have to go back when disaster strikes, like we've had this last year, and many ranchers have been forced to liquidate some of their herds. They're, they have no disaster assistance during that time for loss of forage or the required liquidation of livestock. And you know what happens when you liquidate livestock all at the same time, prices go down. So you don't 
you're not able to take advantage of what would be good traditional marketing practices. So we believe there should be a disaster program that steps in to help cushion those situations that are beyond the control of an individual producer. Isn't it gonna become like acid reflux now? Prices go down because everybody has to sell. And then, then when they don't have replacement and so on, then our, our, our price is likely to spike them uh, down the line because they, they've had to get rid of their herds and so on. So the next year they don't have, uh, they don't have livestock and so forth. So it seems to me that if we've got low prices now, just because there's a lot of people having to force sale, then are we likely to have much higher prices when they recover? When they recover. And the market price may be up there, but there may not be any cattle to sell. And so the, the goal of disaster is to be able to provide that assistance at the time of when you have that economic hardship so that it comes time of which you want to buy those replacements, you've got some dollars of which to do that because those replacement costs are probably going to be higher. So if you assist that, you help then bring back that livestock industry. So, yeah, you're right, but prices can be relatively good, but if a producer, you don't have anything to sell, prices really don't mean much. Well, not to them, but to the consumer. Oh, to the you consumer, the you bet. Market, I would think. Yeah, and, and the industry, the agri-industry, will make sure that happens. <laughs> and prices will go up for consumers a lot faster than they'll ever come down. Okay. And that's the sad part is when you take a look at livestock and you take a look at Wyoming, it's a livestock producing state, but it doesn't have packing plants of which to sell. So you have to export your livestock to be slaughtered. You are an importing state when it comes to beef consumption. Isn't that pretty sad? Yeah. When you're producing it right here in the state, you have to export it for processing, import it back for consumption. And when we take a look at the market, the market is very concentrated. We're back to, I referred to the antitrust laws. If you take a look at the monopolistic control that's occurring today, not only in the processing sector, not only in beef, but in many of the grain commodities, it is huge. And a lot of those companies, multinational in nature, not only are in beef, they're in pork, they're in lamb, they're in grains, not only for the nature of purchasing the raw commodity, but they're involved in the processing, and then they have a network or a linkage in the retail sector. And it's scary when you take a look at, for example, Walmart's introduction now into the food system, and it's almost, I think, over 25 cents of every dollar spent, spent at Walmart on food. It's gained that much just in the short time they've been in. And in Mexico, for example, it's over 50 cents of every dollar spent is spent in a Walmart affiliate. Yeah. So we got concentration not only occurring in the area of procurement of agricultural commodities, processing, but there's also, for the consumer side, a very growing concentration of where food availability is. That's one of the reasons within our efforts of the Farm Bill, we're a strong advocate of advancing local food systems. And the reason we think that government needs to partner, and not control, but partner with those that have the initiative within the communities is how do you compete with a Walmart unless you have that support of which to get established and create that that system. So the, the crop insurance that you're advocating, would this be something that would be available to small producers that are growing food and not commodities like vegetables and fruit? Yes, that's what we're attempting to get expanded. Currently, they haven't reached in that area. We think the crop insurance program has to expand to get into that area. Yeah. yeah. I think the biggest CSA in the country, I think, would Grant Family Farm is yeah, just bankruptcy. Right. Yeah, right. And their challenge was they got fairly large, uh, labor intensive. They had a couple years when I talked to that operation where they left over a million dollars of commodities in the field because they couldn't get the labor of which to harvest it at the right time. 
And as you all know, that's a seasonal operation when you're in that kind of business. And if you don't have the labor at the time you need it, that product's not going to be available for retail. And they had the markets, mm -hmm. but they just couldn't procure the product. Well, you run into a couple years in a row where you're leaving that much value in the field, you're going to run into some tough economic times. And so you can say, oh, yeah, but they were too large. Well, yeah, they were too large. But we have immigration issues. OK? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you can't have seasonal workers there at the right time, that's when these kind of uh, ventures are going to struggle. And so uh, a lot of finger pointing will be done, but there's a lot of issues that impact those kind of operations. And dairy faces the same way, but theirs is year-round labor versus a vegetable operation, fruit and vegetables, which is more seasonal, especially in our area. Did they get caught up in all that water issue there? I know some of the farmers there ran out of water at the end of the season. Yeah, but I think they were, in their case, uh, pretty much completed in their, their harvest. Mm -hmm. and, and they had procured enough water to make it through. So, because a lot of them, they have bought extra water if it was available. But, you know, that's the year that it's available. Where now we look at the pack that we have this year and it's 50% of normal. And we just come off a drought. Um, a lot of cities that have had water to sell uh, in the past are not putting it up for bids. So it's uh, changing dynamics as we look at the impacts of water situation in the West today. It's uh, really coming into play in a whole different, different manner. What do you think is the, are the chances of fruit and vegetables actually coming under this kind of, um, into the policy instead of being left out? Oh, I think if we have to keep the pressure on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think because of, you know, Western Growers, for example, association out of California, is more reliant on that, and they're having water issues out there. So more of the production base is now facing some levels of instability to say, how do we deal with those factors and get some protection for the investment that we have to make in the procurement of input products, fertilizers, all that are required ahead of time before you can ever go to harvest? How do you protect that? At the same time, banks and financial institutions across the board that provide the financing are saying, we want a program that can help ensure so that we can get paid if you happen to lose your crop due to Mother Nature. So it doesn't protect a bad producer, but it is there for some economic uh, stability when you make those investments in your operation. So I think it will come. Uh, we just have to get some production history that can be validated um, because, you know, one thing that drives everything is people's greed. I, I wish that wasn't the case, but it is the case, and it comes into play. Uh, we kind of like to blame the government, but it's a lot of what people may do to try to manipulate a program that uh, puts in place the reason to blame the government, and uh, that's pretty sad. One of the other things that's a key part of the Farm Bill is what we do in education and research in the public arena. And what concerns us is that there's been pressure to reduce the amount of dollars that are available for land-grant institutions of which to do public research. We think more dollars should be made available because that research is for the public benefit. If a university has to depend more upon donations from companies, corporations, of which then own that research that's done, that's not of the public benefit. Because you take a look at some of the research that's been done, producers are now having to pay for it in the cost of seed, in the cost of fertilizers. You have to pay additional dollars. And yet those companies got that research done when the public invested in the brick and mortar and the researchers and the research farms 
and they then developed and the benefited from the research. So we strongly support more dollars into research through our land-grant institutions, but for the public benefit. And that the, you know, if we do improve the quality of seed, it should stay in the public arena and not be bought by a multinational corporation. And that way we could protect also the value of traditional seeds because I'm really concerned of where we're going and the loss of some of our just traditional seeds, non-GMO product that people may wish to produce. How, how would this change that? I don't see how this would change that. Well, if we had more public research, more public dollars spent in the development of those seeds, it would stay in the public arena. We've done a problem. The problem is patent on genetic life. If a company can patent genetic life, you, you can't. Can, it's very hard to contain the spores of, of an agricultural crop. So if you buy into Monsanto seeds and you plant those in, into your ground, into your crop, your neighbor who isn't growing Monsanto is going to have contaminated crop. He can't collect the seeds anymore. They have a patent on his genetic or on the genetic life. They can come and seize his land, seize his crops, and he can't grow anymore. I don't see how this is going to change that how it's going to keep the purity of seed. Well, there's a number of ways that, that can be done. I think what you're talking about is if corn is planted, GMO corn is planted next to non-GM corn, by the pollination, you can have the contamination. No doubt about that. But you can also take a look at what our land grants did prior to Monsanto introducing GMO. We used a lot of plant traits to improve the plants. It was plant genetics to plant genetics. It wasn't the insertion of non-plant genetics, okay? So if we can have universities come back to those kind of seed productions and seed improvements and seed enhancements, and also look at how we do set up some natures of requirements of boundaries in the area of uh, pollination and planting of one pollinated crop next to another, we can then protect that, uh, that plant and that improvements made in that seed. And so there's a lot of factors within that, but if our research system isn't there to be independent and be public to the public benefit, we lose it totally. And that's where I'm concerned a lot of the direction that we're headed. And so uh, that's one of the pushes we like to, like to make. Well, isn't it really too prone because if Monsanto can patent this, they say, well, uh, it blows over there, so you're infringing the patent. And that's something, the wind blows that, and you don't have any control over that. It doesn't seem that they should be able to patent processes that are, that, that are nature-driven like that. that they, they just shouldn't be able to say, they, they shouldn't be able to do it. I think you're right. But what he's pointed out, and there is law cases now where a neighbor who says that he did not buy any GMO seed when they held back their seed showed that the genetics were there, okay? Monsanto has sued them because they have infringed on their genetic rights, their materials that they own. He didn't own it. Now you got control of it. And so they have sued and successfully so far in the courts to say that that's their product. And so uh, even though you didn't intend that to happen, uh, it's been held up in courts that they own it. So uh, and it, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it's right. Yeah. The appropriations of this, it, it's being appropriated into research, I get that, to create newer um, strains, more efficient strains using plant plant genetics, I get that. Um, but if the problem is, is going to be a cyclic event every growing season, we have contaminated crops from GMO or whatever, then we, I see a problem of a constant stream of seed, seeds needing to be supplied to the public. Is there appropriations within this bill that allow for a distribution network between land grant universities and farmers? Well, no, not within, not within the legislation. But what we have seen uh, happen, uh, and I'll just use the example of um, 
wheat and potato producers in uh, Colorado. They have worked with uh, CSU to um, do the very thing you talked about in the nature of wheat, uh, improving the wheat seeds and the wheat varieties. And by their success, they now have a foundation of which owns that seed and now markets it. It's not GMO, it's non-GMO. And so producers are able to buy that improved plant varieties directly from this foundation, of which is a joint ownership between the wheat producers and the CSU. And they're able to then use that money to continue to advance research. So, and they do market it outside the state of Colorado. So it's got a broader base of marketing. And who's marketing this, the university's marketing? It's a foundation that's been created. Uh, potatoes in Colorado have looked at doing the same type of thing. Now, one of the things that you will find in the discussion and the debate is wheat has made an effort to try to avoid the introduction of GMOs because most wheat is used in some type of food production. When you take a look at corn or soybeans, which is probably 99% GMO now, they're not used in the food system. They're used in the feed system. They're fed to livestock in most cases. Now, in some places, soybeans are processed for oil. So less resistance within the production area of corn and soybeans, for example, of the introduction to GMO. What is concern is now that there's looking at GMO introduction into fruits and vegetables, into alfalfa and those types of products. And so the concern of GMO in the food system grows. Now, there's not yet documented that that's not necessarily bad, but when you take into consideration those that want to produce product that's not GMO to go in the food system, how do you maintain its integrity? And what, what's your support system to maintain the integrity? Because it hasn't been proven in the courts. So that's a, a real legitimate concern in this overall debate of the changing dynamics of what's happening to our, our seed development. So uh, some of that will play out in support within the farm bill. Some of that will play out on the investments by multinational corporations, who you so rightly pointed out, they control the ownership. And one of the things that, from our organization standpoint, we have opposed, and that is that there's been an effort made by some of these corporations to introduce uh, genetically modified plants for pharmaceuticals and to grow in the, in the public arena. We're really concerned about that because when you talk about a trait transferring across the fence, what happens if a pharmaceutical trait transfers across the fence and you sell your product into a normal marketing chain and someone reacts to that as a reaction to whatever that pharmaceutical genetic was? Who has the liability? Where does that come back? So we've adamantly opposed any production of genetically modified crops for pharmaceutical purposes in anything in the public arena. If they want to do that test, they've got to do it in an enclosed element. The other thing of real concern is because of the nature of how we harvest anymore through harvesters that travel from Texas all the way to North Dakota, is you would carry those genetics across this country. Because you can't get everything out of a combine. You don't get everything out of your wagon. And so it moves on down the line. It contaminates the elevators where it's dropped off. And so you just have a multiplying concern and effect. So, so that's one of the areas where, again, you get back to what can the Farm Bill do is what can we do to advance um, local food systems? 
back in 2008 in the Farm Bill, one of the things that would relate to consumers, it was the passage of the Farm Bill of establishing country of origin labeling, the COOL program. And so we've ran into problems with that because Canada doesn't like it because a lot of their cattle and hogs come into this country for processing. And, you know, if they have to label that as to Canadian pork or Canadian beef, what will be the reaction of American consumer and what's the cost factor for a packing plant to separate out Canadian cattle or Canadian hogs from American hogs in their processing. So uh, there has to be some tweak. They went to WTO and got a favorable ruling. Um, the interesting thing in the ruling is it said that our country has a right to require labeling. We just have to make sure that the rules are written in a nature not to disrupt the international market system. So now we're asking USDA to make sure the rules are tweaked of which to make it work. Uh, Senator Enzi has supported that effort, has a letter, a joint letter with a bipartisan letter of Democrats and Republicans urging USDA now to move forward to make sure that the appropriate rules get adopted. We support that. We think that consumers have a right to know. And we're different than a lot of other agricultural groups in that we support the labeling of GMO food products as well. And it's not to say GMO is good or bad, but you should have a right to know. If the food product you buy has been processed with a, you know, a certain percentage of GMO product, and it's just, it's just what we believe is the right thing to do. If you can know its nutritional value, what are the other factors that you should have a right to know? What, what is the argument that GMO, they're resisting it, they're, what's their rationale for resisting it? Labeling? Yeah, label, GMO labeling. What they say is if you label it as GMO, that that means it's bad. I mean, that's just, that's their argument. Well, yeah, that, you wouldn't yeah. anything they're afraid of what is happening in France. As soon as France labeled GMO, within two years, nobody bought it. Yeah. It, their sales plummeted and it can be virtually became extinct. Yeah. So they're concerned of that loss because of informed consumers choosing not to purchase that. But our, our, my feeling is, is that consumers have a right to know and they can purchase whatever they want. If they have confidence in the food system, then they'll purchase it. And so, you know, I mean, but that's their argument is that, you know, uh, it'll be a negative light. Yeah, so that's just, it's a debate in philosophy at that point. And something like say, you get prosperity even though this gene builds us in an in insecticide or a herbicide, builds it right into the plant. And they say, oh, well, you can't hurt you any. How do they know? Well, so they seem to me yeah, that I should get, yeah, you know, no the thing is that they say we wouldn't buy it if I knew. Well, then obviously it should be sold. And, and there's, you know. Never seen before. And the introduction of, of GMOs is relatively new, okay, in the history of production of food, okay? So there's really not a relevant, I, I think, time period of which to say it carries over into the food system or it doesn't carry over into the food system. There's still a period, you know, an unknown that may be known into the future. Because I, I, I can look back on our farm in southwestern Minnesota. We use chemicals, spraying weeds, that we mixed right by the well. And if you know most family farms, we had an old 55 gallon barrel in the back of a Fordson with booms out to the side, stuck the garden hose into the tank, and mixed the chemical in, and then went to check on the cows or the chickens or, or the pigs, came back, and most of the time that barrel was running over, and our well water changed flavor. 
Well, it wasn't too much later and they banned the product because it had carcinogens in it, which we didn't know about. We were never trained in it. You know, the after effect of that, and my dad was 72 years of age and developed kidney cancer. Well, what, what does a kidney do but flushes out all the chemicals that come through your system? Did it tie back? I don't know. We didn't do full-fledged biopsy to check. But you think back to our practices when we farmed using chemicals that later were banned because of having cancer carcinogens in it, you can't help but think it had a relationship. So as we take a look at the changing dynamics of what we may do in our food production system, do we want to make sure we keep a watchful eye on how it impacts the food and how it impacts the health of our citizens of which we feed? Because we're very proud in agriculture of having the most abundant supply of food and we've been very proud it's been the safest supply of food because we have in place a number of balances and checks, be it FDA's role or USDA's inspection service. We have a number of checks and balances in place to assure consumers of the quality of food that American farmers and ranchers produce. We want to make sure that that integrity holds up. We have now a lot of influences coming in place from outside sources that are changing the dynamics of that from where we were. We need to be vigilant in working with them and monitoring them. And we need the farm program to make sure it provides the funds so we can maintain that kind of research, and independent research. Um, the appropriations for the disaster and uh, the crop insurance, how, how much were you wanting to take out and out of which program? Oh, okay. It was out of nutrition? No, no, no. The additional funding to go into crop insurance and into disaster assistance would come out of the dollars saved in doing away with direct payments in the commodity title. Currently, we expend about $5 billion a year in direct payments. Over a 10-year period of which they use in budgeting, that's $50 billion. Well, we're saying that some of that can go to savings, overall savings. Some of that should shore up those programs, along with others. There's money to then shore up what we can do in local food systems and organic support and in a number of those areas. Um, so, no, uh, we would not support at all taking money out of the nutrition title to shore up what we can do in crop insurance and uh, disaster. And to give you an example, on the disaster assistance that we looked at pertaining to livestock, livestock forage uh, from 2012, uh, there was an amendment put on uh, the uh, Sandy Disaster Assistance, and I think that they felt could encompass all the losses that would be filed was about a hundred and a little over a hundred million dollars. So it's it's not a big amount for a disastrous year for that sector, and that included farm-raised fish, and that included. Um, Farmers fished and honeybees as well. So, small portion. When you take a look at that impact, though, multiplying many times over in a rural community. So that's that's the importance. And when we talk about nutrition title, we support the nutrition title being in the farm bill. You will hear some talk about well, if we separated out the nutrition title. You know, we could just have a standalone farm conservation trade bill. One of the things that linking them together, number one is within the uh, farm bill, they're required, like in the school lunch program, to procure their food products domestically. It's only commodities which we may not produce, like bananas or something like that, that they procure outside our country. So we build that linkage in. When we take a look at the SNAP program, we've now got the SNAP program where recipients can now go to farmers markets and buy their products instead of just going to Walmart and getting their products, which may be imported. 
So the more linkage we can have between those in this program and our domestic production and our own food system, we think it's better for our economy. And the, the argument that I think stands up is for every dollar spent in nutrition title, it brings back into the economy about a dollar and 60 some cents. So we don't want to diminish the importance of those nutrition programs and their relationship back to domestic produce agriculture. And that's meats, and that's grains, that's the full picture of our food supply system. Do the direct, um, the people who get direct payments, do they have an organization that they're going to stand up and lobby for their side? No, because there are members. They're the members of the Farm Bureau, they're the members of a lot of different organizations, the wheat growers and the corn growers. Um, where direct payments came about was when we made the transition from the 2002 to 2007 Farm Bill. There wasn't direct payments. There was supports that were tied to production. And the WTO was saying, you have to modify. You've got to move to the blue box or the green box from the blue box. And so to comply with the new international trade rules, they said that you could go to direct payments that wouldn't be associated with production. So when direct payments were established, they were established based on a production history of an individual farm. And that may be, it was based on the base acres that you had of the eight basic commodities that were supported. And that's in the area of corn and wheat and soybeans and, and down the line. And so they created a formula by which direct payments off of that base history and production history. Um, and that was what originated direct payments. And that's been going on since 2008. Well, now prices have been relatively good due to dramatic conditions around the world and even here domestically that has held up commodity prices because of natural disasters somewhere in the world. And so it has been, from the agricultural community, pretty hard to defend that kind of expenditure of monies when producers have been getting a relatively good price in the market. And so from our standpoint, we've looked at what kind of adjustments should we really seek at this point in time. We do support enhancing a price support system and leaving it within the farm bill. And that is if commodity prices do come down, there would be a level of price support that would kick in. And, and that way, farmers would have some tools to work with in the marketing of their product. You know, one thing the Bible teaches us is that we should have reserves for times of drought so that we don't end up with a short supply of food that we don't sit and talk about $8 milk. But we've eliminated totally in the 2000 period any type of reserves. Any reserve of grain right now is held by multinationals, not held by producers. And one of the things that we have felt would be an important tool to put in the market or in the farm bill is to have what we call a loan program that if commodity prices come down, a producer could look at putting their grain under loan with a commitment to repay that loan, of course, but then have a greater marketing period of which to look at how to get the best price in the marketplace. And that way you've got a reserve at a time when you talk about if prices go up, there is a supply of which to move into the market. So we won't run short of having bread available or other food supplies available. But we've taken that out of farmers' hands right now, totally, in the structure of our current farm bill. So how would you provide reserves right now? I mean, we can't even provide probably what we need or have been providing. How, how do you produce more of reserves? Well, I, you know, I guess I'm an optimistic person, and I guess that most farmers and ranchers are, is that, you know, we don't believe we'll continue to see these dramatic crisis in production, be it 
in the United States or in Australia or in Europe that sometime there's going to be full production throughout the globe. And it doesn't take much at that point in time of which to create some significant surpluses. And again, with the market as concentrated as it is, those prices will go down very, very quickly for the procurement of that raw product. If there's any kind of signal of a surplus, they just drop the price. But I'm just thinking, what if the drought continues? We don't know. Oh, no, if the drought continues, those, those, those programs within the Farm Bill would never be used. Grain would continue to move to the market that is produced, because the demand would be there. So it's just having in place a tool to use should production go back up and commodity prices go down. Again, not going to be a cost factor because the loans would be repaid, but it would be a tool that's not available in the general public. No bank's going to offer that kind of a program. So it just provides that kind of a tool that would be in place should production go back up, or the, the production exceed the demand. So how does, is this loan, pro, is there a structure, I guess I could apply this to both, is this part of the crop insurance, I should say, no. is this loan program? No. Okay. So then my next two questions could apply both to the crop insurance and the loan program. Is there any structure, are the appropriations in place or is there a structure in place, place to focus on local farmers and small farmers? Or is it kind of a free-for-all? Is big agro included in all this too? Is, is, it, is it equal game for everybody? Current farm programs, um, it's small, big, everybody's included. In the debate of the 2012-2013 Farm Bill. They are now looking at some caps on the area of crop insurance. And the Senate put in place a cap of 750,000. The House put a cap in place of 950,000. There are also discussions, although it didn't even get included, but there is discussions of a cap on an individual operator on how much premium subsidy they would get in crop insurance. So what they're trying to look at doing is you would be covered under crop insurance to a point, and then you're kind of on your own. Uh, so, you know, would we assure the underwriting better for the smaller producer to, that's involved? Yes, because they're going to get the maximum support. Where you would is we've had, I think they did an analysis back in the last of the last farm bill. And there was a couple operations in Texas, for example, that I believe got over $3 million in crop insurance subsidies. There was a couple in North Dakota that got over a million dollars. And they said, wait a minute, we shouldn't have the farm program encourage you to get bigger to cover your potential losses. So there, there is a cap based on owner, not not production or ability to prove. No, because it, yeah, it's a total cap because it's going to cover your operation no matter if you produce wheat or corn or rice or whatever you may produce. So, because you want some diversity in your operation, you want rotation in your operation to maintain the soil. So you're looking at that cap on crop insurance no matter what the commodity might be. So how would this cap be I, I guess determine because a, um, a small organic producer might have just like in the main ratios a lot more invested in a really small piece of land rather than a big, if like a big agro um, operation loses a um, hundred thousand dollar field um, they're not gonna you know be trying to feed themselves. Yeah. That small family is going to be trying to feed themselves. You're not going to see the cap affect the smaller producer at all. Okay. They'd be totally covered within the program. It would only be really targeted towards the large. 
and many a, a number of organizations, I won't say all farm organizations, supported a cap back when we had the price support system because we felt the price support system being on cap helped lead to the farm program helping fund larger and larger operations. And so a number of us have supported an appropriate cap so that the program served as a tool for producers, not as a economic engine for producers just to get bigger. We don't think that should be the role of the farm program. It really should be out there to help create food, but from as many diversified producers as we can. I don't care if it's ranchers producing beef or in the area of commodities. And the same goes with our conservation programs. Shouldn't fund being bigger. Should fund the intent. If it's to help sustain the soil, build the quality of the soil, then we should help do that but there should be a limit on how much any one producer can receive in their, in their area, and in, in the program. So that's, uh, that's part of the debate, and that comes down to political will, you know, based on what your philosophical belief is. And sometimes you win those, and sometimes you don't. So do you, does your group, um go to the legislature in Wyoming and Colorado and talk with legislators about uh, whatever might be coming up. And so you're, you're a lobbying group, and that's, that's where you go first? Yeah, we're an advocacy organization. Mm -hmm. The policy of our organization is adopted by our members. Uh, members have an opportunity to come to the annual meeting, debate, and develop the policy from A to Z. Then that's when my role comes in as uh, government relations uh, is to look at that policy. Uh, we have Scott Zimmerman, as you mentioned, in, at, the, at the Wyoming legislature. We have a full-time lobbyist at the Colorado and the same in New Mexico as we represent producers in all three states. And so um, their responsibility is in representing that policy in debates that arise we may advance some of the debate or we react to the debate. Uh, we do the same on the federal level. Uh, we work with the National Farmers Union and within that they have full-time lobbyists in Washington. We also work with the senators and representatives from all three states so they make sure, you know, we make sure they know what Rocky Mountain Farmers Union's position is because sometimes that may differ from what may be advocated out of Illinois or Indiana. They're not as arid as we are, so sometimes different policies come into place. Um, and and you know, when you take a look at the seasonal crop production that's unfolding in Wyoming and Colorado and New Mexico versus the opportunities they have in California, totally different. Creating a local food system in Colorado and Wyoming and New Mexico, totally different than California. You know, you can go three miles to one community to another in California. You've got to go a lot more miles to create the opportunity here. When we talk about the challenge of livestock producers wanting to market their own beef with their own label, it's a lot different challenge here than it is where you have a locker plant within 50 miles that's USDA inspected. So we have to represent those different kind of challenges that we may have within the rural areas of Wyoming and Colorado and New Mexico versus what will be represented in other states. So that's, that's our role in advocacy uh, that we carry out, be it uh, what happens in Cheyenne or Denver or Santa Fe, as well as in Washington. So our next question, I think, from Learning Local Foods anyway, is how, how can we feel like we have some input as individuals and as a very small group here? Sure. I think what you need to take a look at is what is the issue that's most important to, to your people? And then how can that best be addressed? Is it 
by an action at the state level, or is it something that ties in to one of the sections of the Farm Bill? Uh, or is it a change that needs to be incorporated within the Farm Bill? Uh, or is it a separate initiative? For example, this year in Colorado, we have a legislator, legislator that's introducing a bill calling for GMO labeling at the state level. Now, I don't think it's going to make it out of committee, but the initiative is being made and the debate is beginning to be held. Okay? So informed people rise to the surface. Well, why don't we have that? Why isn't it happening? I never heard of that before. So you start that process, okay? So, um, and that's best done from the local level up. As I was talking about cool, you have a senator from Wyoming that is advancing cool rules to be adopted to make sure it's implemented. A letter of support to that senator saying, we, we really thank you for your leadership in pushing to have cool fully implemented. Cool. Country of origin labeling. And so, you know, those are things that you can do at the local level because when you write to the senator and let him know how you feel, <clears throat> another issue arises, his office may reach out to you. What do you think of this issue? So once you create that communications, communications in many times starts going both ways. So that's, that's how I would encourage you to, to be engaged. The same will go as we begin the process of now the, the Farm Bill. Um, following the adoption of the fiscal cliff, in our th three state region, we only have one senator that's on the Ag Committee. Disappointing, not a six, but we have one. We immediately called his staff person and sat down and talked about the steps that we felt the Senate should look at taking in relation to now moving forward on the adoption of a farm bill. Why did we do that? When you look at the budget negotiations, the deficit negotiations that are now required by the fiscal cliff agreement, they put a time frame in place, 60 days, to reach an agreement on deficit reduction. From the agricultural community, we don't have a lot of representation in Congress. What we wanted, what we encouraged the senator to do was contact Chairman Stabenow so that the Ag Committee begin immediately in the adoption of a farm bill to put the stake in the ground as to how much in that deficit reduction agriculture will contribute. If we don't set it, but our budget is set by the negotiators, then what kind of farm bill will we end up with? Will we lose funding for local foods? Will we lose funding for organics? Will we lose those kind of gains that we've made over the last 10 years? What we want to do is get in the driver's seat so we set from an agricultural standpoint, we're on the offense rather than on the defense. So we held that and we followed that up then with a letter to him outlining the points that we felt needed to be addressed and how important we felt they were. So if you do nothing else, even if the Senate doesn't get the Farm Bill done, what have we done? We've started getting some of the members, key members of the Senate Ag Committee, talking about what should be agriculture's portion. What kind of farm bill can we write with this kind of budget? And will that have an impact on the budget negotiations? We hope so. Is this a new Congress or a continuous? No, a new Congress. Okay, so they have to start over with the farm bill. Absolutely. Every piece of legislation that was not passed by both houses and on the president's desk is dead. So they start all over. Does your group do any kind of a, let's say one page, <laughs> summary of some of these things that we could be, say on an email list, that we would get an update of, we don't need a lot of information, but something to sort of keep us in the loop? We'll be glad to. 
Um, I can pass around if you want to give me your email address. We do a weekly, uh, what's called legislator, that highlights what's going on in Cheyenne and what's going on in Denver and what's going on in Santa Fe, just to give you an idea of the region. And uh, we also include from time to time then, um, you know, what kind of communications we're having uh, with uh, Washington. In the last one, we outlined our letter, the points that we felt why the Senate needed to act and act now. So uh, we have that and it goes out weekly during the legislative session. As you know, Wyoming's is very short, but it continues on till the end of the Colorado session. So you keep getting during that time. But Could we post that on our website? Sure, you can use it in any way you would like. But we, we email it out, so you know it doesn't really cost anything because we just prepare it in-house. I think the first time uh, in our uh, library local food gathering, uh, we, had, we had somebody talk to us the first time about this, and uh, Scott did, and, and I think two of us kind of had the same idea at the same moment. Vicky and I said, well, how, might, how effective would it be for us instead of trying to, uh, to lobby people where we don't really know exactly what we're doing? to lobby you with our concerns. Sure. Is that, is that, uh, or does that, <laughs> do you think that'd be effective? Or? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, we're open to listen to constituents and anybody in Wyoming, Colorado and New Mexico is our constituent. So we try to listen to what their thoughts and concerns are if it's compatible with what our membership has laid out as a policy, why not work together? And does it help you? Of you, course it helps us. You can say we have the support of A, B, C, and D. Absolutely. It, you know, the more linkages you can put together. Uh, to give just an example, we were working uh, on EPA Region 8 on a dust issue where they would set the level of dust that would affect breathing of people. And all the ag groups collaborated together in trying to sustain the level that EPA had. Because we all worked together, not giving up our independence, but we all believed in the same thing, we were successful in getting EPA to leave the standard the same. So the collaboration of groups working together can have a tremendous influence and impact. We've got a, a small group of local, there's 27 producers, they, they like to call themselves farmers. They live in the city of Denver. They farm on little plots and some of them sell at a farmer's market. It's not a big acreage, but they have now collaborated with the, what we call our Denver Jefferson chapter of the Farmers Union, for all urban, but they've now got word with the governor's office, or the mayor's office, who attends their meetings because they want to use land that the city owns that's currently in weeds, so they've agreed to control the weeds and handle that as long as they can produce food on it. They've worked with the mayor's office on food or water taps. And so the effort of collaboration and cooperation is resulting in them being able to produce more food. And the mayor now has made a commitment of increasing the amount of locally produced food within the Denver school system. So now they're looking at not only being able to produce more food, but now a collaboration and cooperation of a local market to the school system. So the school officials came to the last meeting talking about how they could look at the appropriate preparation of the food because you gotta have standard food, you can have food quality that's all over the place. But the collaboration and the coordination of those groups and individuals is now resulting in them improving their economic well-being. We couldn't ask for anything more. So do you know with that group, um, when you say water taps, are they tapping into city water and are they paying a different rate than a residential 
rate, like in Laramie, our water rates are pretty high, and a lot of people have stopped producing all these small pots because the water rates that you pay for city water are so high. And and I, I, I've been trying to find places where they push policy through so that if you're growing food, that you pay a different water rate. Than I can't answer that question, but it's one we can find out for you. I don't. I'm, I just know that they were there and in the discussions. I sat back and said, wow, <laughs> this is exciting. Not only have the school district there talking about how to provide food, but there was the mayor's office sitting there, how do we collaborate with you on land and water? So, you know, those are the kind of things that we help facilitate through advocacy. One of the other elements of the uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union and that is, is that uh, our foundation, we have a foundation, there's the farm organization, which is the advocacy, and we have a foundation which does a lot of education, works with college kids down to youth of six, seven years old. Um, but we also have within our foundation what's called our Co-op and Economic Development Center. It's one of the longest continuous funding development centers because it's funded by USDA Rural Development, to help people uh, look at working together to meet marketing needs, input needs, whatever it might be. And so uh, when you talk about local foods, um, they have worked and there's a new, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but it's uh, in the three counties of Goshen, Laramie, that is now doing a local foods uh, oh, like triple crown, triple crown. Uh, that was helped incubated by our co-op development center so we've got one in uh, eastern colorado western kansas that markets to the denver front range has monthly delivery of local foods all produced by local producers got their label on it but they collaborate together through the cooperative to market, all done by the internet. And consumers buy a membership into the co-op as well as the producers buy a membership into the co-op. And so it links those two directly, but we helped incubate that. So, and we do all kinds of programs of that nature. We worked uh, with One Down Steamboat to help them get a local foods uh, we not only do local foods, but we also worked in Northwest Colorado of communities that were losing uh, daycare facilities because of the tremendous administrative cost every daycare had to go through of background checks and fingerprints and payroll costs. And so we met with all those our representatives did from our co-op center to look at how they could administratively join together, maintain their own independence as a daycare, but have one administrative office that would handle payroll and handle the background checks and those kind of, so they formed a co-op but kept their independence. And the importance for us was that if we're gonna keep young families in rural communities, they look at education, they look at healthcare, and they look at how my kid's gonna be taken care of because both are probably gonna be working you know, both spouses are gonna be working. So if we can help in that, maintaining a service that they need as young families, then we'll keep young families in rural areas. Without it, they'll leave. They'll go to Cheyenne, they'll go to Laramie. They won't be in the rural communities. So that's one of the other services that we have as an organization that uh, if your community sees a need, I know we've worked with a local food co-op here um, and over time. The other one that we're very proud to have incubated that really is out on its own is the Lamb Co-op. That's based here in, Mon in, in Wyoming, but now serves lamb producers in 12 states. Probably the single largest marketer of lamb in the nation. So pretty exciting that we can help people help themselves. And they own the co-op. We don't, all we do is help them get through all the feasibility studies and where do they look for financing and how to set all that up? Bylaws, articles of incorporation, those things that are very necessary to succeed. So uh, one of the things we just helped incubate in Colorado 
I'm hoping we'll be able to make available to people in Wyoming, and that is a new uh, health insurance co-op. And uh, our goal is to have it up and running and be on the marketplace on January 1st. So people that are not insured can look at it as one of the opportunities. But every policyholder will own that co-op. They will elect the board of directors. They will help make the decisions as to if that co-op is profitable, does it lower its rates? Does it look at other services? But the board will decide that the members will own that thing. It won't be run by corporate interests. And we're excited about that. And I have a real rural tint to it, tilt to it. We're excited about that. Is that just for Colorado? Did you say for January 1st, it's just Colorado? Well, as of right now, we're licensed in Colorado. Uh, Wyoming legislature is looking at legislation because they haven't created their own marketplace, their own state exchange, of allowing uh, Wyoming people to purchase from neighboring states if they have a marketplace. So I approached our co-op, which is just being developed, to see if they would seek license in Wyoming so that for the southern tier, the border Colorado, people might look at our marketplace and look at that co-op. And so I don't know if we'll get there by January 1st, but that discussion is underway. Very little, didn't they have something like that in Grand Junction? Don't they seem to have a very good program there? Yeah. Is it something like that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a takeoff of that. That's not a pure co-op, but it is a, a community collaboration, yes. And we had great discussions with them as we moved towards the process of looking at the viability of creating a statewide health insurance co-op. So, uh, yeah, we had discussions with them. So... Uh, we're excited about it, but that's, that's part of who Farmers Union is. So, uh, and from my own background, I grew up on a family farm in southwestern Minnesota, very diversified. And uh, then uh, we didn't have branding, so I was able to go across the border into South Dakota when I got out of the service and uh, farmed in eastern South Dakota. And uh, having been involved as a youth in Farmers Union, um, I got reinvolved in South Dakota in Farmers Union and uh, ended up um, working uh, with the South Dakota Farmers Union. And in 1981, was elected their state president. And in 1988, um, the national president uh, was retiring. And I decided, why not? And uh, sought the office of national president and ran against a very good friend of mine, a gentleman named John Stencil, who at that time was president of Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. And uh, John and I both ran for the presidency in 1988. And I was fortunate enough to beat him by a little bit. We still have maintained a strong friendship um, and so I served from 88 to 2002 as national president. And 14 years is a long stretch. Uh, I'm based out of Denver, but spent about 40, 45% of my time in DC. I spent another 30, 35% on the road, very little time in Denver. And so the end of 14 years and the changes that were occurring uh, after 9-11, uh, we had 300 and some people in Washington, D.C. on 9-11 from all over the nation. And we had to spend a week trying to get them back home because of airplanes being shut down. We had some from Alaska. We had some from Hawaii, California. And that was a real challenge. And it just changed the dynamics of everything. So I retired in 2002. And I got a call from a friend of mine in California that said, oh, you're not ready to retire. Why don't you come out here and work for a CAF, Community Alliance of Family Farmers? 
And what that little small, it's a small little nonprofit based out of Davis, California. But it worked with the University of California in how walnut producers could reduce the amount of chemicals they used in growing walnuts. And we did it successfully. Reduce the amount of spray, of which then less chemicals in the water. And if you're familiar at all with California, the water table is right there. <laughs> and so tremendous improvements made to the environment. We looked at implementing how they could, instead of burn all the trimmings, grind the trimmings and use it on the ground to maintain moisture. And so those were practices we worked in cooperation with the University of California, a land grant institution, which now has taken over those programs in working with producers. The other thing we did was work with local producers in creating local food systems, farmers markets, and also direct marketing to schools. And we took on a real task in Southern California of creating a co-op, which farmers would deliver product to and the schools would place an order, and we would fill the order. And we started with, I think it was 10 schools. And when I left there at the end of 04, we were had a demand of 40 schools. We had a demand of colleges. We had a demand from uh, hospitals that wanted food product. <clears throat> Couldn't meet it all. But that's the exciting part of, is there an opportunity for local food systems? You bet there is. But the more diversified you can make the production base, it doesn't have to be large acreage. The better quality you will maintain in your product you provide. And the better consistency you maintain, the better your market is. And the more consistent your market is, the more they want to come back to you for that food. That's the exciting thing that I think we can bring about. So I worked on that for two and a half years. Came back to Colorado because uh, I got an ultimatum from my fiance at that time to either come back to Colorado or find a different girlfriend. <laughs> Plus I had two daughters and a son in Denver and a granddaughter. So Denver kind of came back to life. And then John Stencil approached me and said, we need an executive director with Rocky Mountain Farmers Union because um, we're, we're changing the structure of our organization. We're going to a full-time producer as president, and they want somebody to manage the organization. So I stepped in and helped with that from 2005 to, I think it was 09, and we transitioned then to another executive director, and I stayed on to handle government relations and organization development for to the end of this year. And then we'll see how retirement really treats me. <laughs> Within our three state region, we have two types of membership. We have a regular membership, which is really reaching out and targeted to a lot of active producers. Mm -hmm. And then we have an associate membership uh, because of our work in creating local foods market. We've got more interest of consumers that are worried about food safety, worried about where their food comes from, how it's produced. And so we created an associate membership, non-voting, so they can't influence the policy that's designed to represent rural uh, the production interests. Uh, but our membership right now is around 23,000 in all three states. And are most of them, what size are most of them? Small, medium? Well, I, you know, I don't know on acreage because we really don't evaluate the producer total on acreage. But because our producers would vary in all sizes. We have a lot of smaller producers, medium-sized producers, but I think we have a number of larger producers. But what most producers that are attracted to our organization are those that are responsible for their own management, their labor, their operation. If they are operating for Ted Turner, they're probably not attracted to us. Okay? So if they're a farm manager, they're probably not attracted to our organization. Because our organization really would like to see farms and ranches owned and operated by producers. And that's becoming rarer and rarer. I'm, I'm very concerned of the direction we're headed 
You see a lot of investment banks now coming out and bidding up land like you can't believe. And they're just hiring farm managers to hire somebody to run the operation. And they're looking at a certain rate of return. And that scares me because, you know, when you're, when you're a livestock producer and that's your cattle out there, you're concerned about them and their health and the weather, and taking care of them, and the newborn, and you treat them as one of your own. If you're a manager, are you going to have that same level of commitment? No. So our membership is mainly focused around that ownership, that responsibility. They may hire, just like the grant farmers and others, hire seasonal labor. Uh, that, that's a fact of life now. But that doesn't mean that they're still not family-based. We have one of our members that's very large in eastern Colorado, but he has six members of the family that are all back to farming. So when you look at it as a family operation, are they going to be fairly large? Yeah, there are a lot of acres. But when you spread that over six families, it's not that many acres. So, you know, I didn't... I don't like to just paint a picture and this is who we are because we're really made up of a lot of different varieties. And I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm glad we got lamb producers and beef producers and we have some geese producers and you know, you name it. That diversity is good within the organization. It makes us respect what others do. We have organic producers. We have traditional producers they gain a true respect for one another. And that's important. They're going to collaborate and work together. And I, I would share with you when, you, when you look at a farm bill, you want to get full understanding. This is all you got to look at. But what this document does, uh, this is put out by the Congressional Research Service. But it does a side-by-side. -side. Here's the current farm bill from 2000, that expired. Then you got in the middle the Senate passed version and then the House Ag Committee's version. And it's every title, every section of the farm bill, side by side all the way through. And so when you take a look at, for example, organic or labeling or whatever, you can see the similarities or the differences. It tells you the funding variances and differences. So when we talk about how do we reach those compromises, and you go through a section and it says, oh, uh, you know, this one here, for example, provides technical amendments and spelling corrections to whatever title it is. The house has identically the same. And you can just see that where the differences occur or where they don't occur. And compromise can be reached. That's, that was the message we gave to our senators. If they just would set aside this partisan division that is affecting not only farm policy but so many important policies in our country and look in black and white what they're saying they're not that far apart we, we can we can address these issues and do it constructively and to the benefit of our people if they would just take time to set aside that partisan politics and say what is it we really need to do? I don't care if it's on farm policy or reform of our tax code, tax policy, if it's dealing with our deficit. We could do it if we just would decide we want to talk to each other regardless of what political party we belong to. One of the greatest things I had back in the 80s and 90s when I was national president was to sit down in a room with George McGovern and Bob Dole. Republican and Democrat, Kansas and South Dakota. They got along, they could talk to each other, they could agree to disagree, and then say, okay, let's go have some coffee. They didn't, they, and after they were both done with service, they still worked together until McGovern passed away. They were great friends. And they bridged the political differences and reach compromises over and over and over. In fact, when they take a look at the International School Lunch Program, 
it came about because of Bob Dole and George McGovern. That's the kind of politics we need backed again today. So.